you never know how far reaching the thoughts, a smile, an act, a word, you never know how far reaching the ripple effects that that can produce. And that is exactly what my dear friend, Dr. Gilles Lamarck has given me and done for me in my life. Uh, Jill, welcome to the Chiropractor's Ed show today. I'm so honored to have you on here, not only as a dear friend, but as a as a mentor and as a as a colleague and as a fierce loyal fighter for chiropractic. Welcome to the show. Oh, thanks so much for inviting me, Jake. It's an honor for me as well to have this opportunity to spend this time with you this morning. Well, thank you so. Um, so, Jill, you hail from the beautiful country of Canada. These days, in the last, gosh, almost 10 years, you have been serving at Life University in Georgia. Um, you and I met when you were serving at uh, Parker, and I attribute a, a large part of my understanding of chiropractic, what chiropractic really is and what chiropractic really isn't because of you. You, your impact on my life and on the chiropractic profession is absolutely incredible, and I am so honored to know you. So give us an idea on what's happening in the, in the world at Life University. Well, you know, I, if, if I'll give you a little bit of the history. You know, Jim Parker was my mentor. So I met Jim when I was a junior in chiropractic college, and he helped me really understand the power of chiropractic. And obviously, that's what I brought to my community. Uh, that's what I brought when I went and uh, served at Parker University for six years. And obviously, I brought the same thing at Life University. It's just it's who I am. So Life University, um, as I chatted with you prior to the recording, you know, you haven't had the pleasure of visiting me here yet. But the way I tell the story, I say from its very humble beginnings in 1974 as Life Chiropractic College, occupying one third of a rented industrial building. Wow. Think about it on Barclay Circle in Marietta, Georgia, has grown to now encompass 110 beautiful acre, acres. Rather, we have hundreds of thousands of square feet of uh, classroom, lab space, uh, residence. We have more than 700 students that actually reside on our campus, wow. currently at about 2,750 total students, uh, offering 21 degree programs. We have 20 NAIA intercollegiate sports teams from rugby, men and women's rugby, men and women's soccer, you know, men and women basketball all the way through. So it, it's this, it's a beautiful campus. But more importantly, beyond the campus is the vitalistic vision at Life University. And so we look at everything through that lens of vitalism. And we recognize that, you know, all organic systems are conscious, self-developing, self-maintaining, self-healing, provided there's no interference. And we look at everything through that lens. So that's how we educate our chiropractic students, but it's also how we educate our students studying positive psychology or students studying nutrition. And I would tell you that when you come on campus, you have this sense of the importance and the power and the reverence that is given to the human being. Uh, the backdrop that is behind me right now is an iconic bell tower structure. What you don't see is the fact that instead of having number one to 12 on the clock, it's the letters chiropractor. Um, but more importantly, beneath it, there is an opening. And the opening is roughly the size of a jail cell. And on the walls of that structure are inscribed the names in stone, are inscribed the names of all the chiropractors that they knew at the time of building the structure in 1994 that had been jailed for practicing medicine without a license. Wow. And there's a beautiful bronze plaque on one side that describes that. And on the other side, there is a similar side. Well, there's the same size bronze plaque that um, actually honors the man who is considered to be the most jailed chiropractor, Dr. Herb Ross Reaver from Ohio. Yep. So when you, when you stand there, there's not a time that I give a tour of the institution that I walk into that, like I said, it's roughly the size of a small jail cell, that I don't feel it in my heart. And, and I tell students and young chiropractors and older chiropractors too, I said, you know, we've heard that term before, we stand on the shoulders of giants. Yes. I'll tell you, the, in the chiropractic profession, we truly stand on the shoulders of giants who did not quit, who continued to teach the principles. And for those of you listening in, 
if you have not read the 33 chiropractic principles, and I'll tell you, it's very common. It's sad when I hear that, but there is a huge percentage of our profession that have never even read the 33 principles. There's some of our profession graduating from other institutions that have never even heard that there were three, that there were 33 chiropractic principles that were put together, you know, back in the 20s. And we teach that. We want our students to understand that because I think if you don't understand the principles, you don't understand the grandeur of this amazing profession. Yes. And how we can impact humanity. You know, you 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 shared a few things that I absolutely love, um, and it just solidifies who you are because what someone consistently talks about, what they think about, what they um, what literally comes out of your mouth is is what you focus on. And I always hear you focus on these principles of love, of truth, where we began. One of my absolute life changing moments that um, that really helped me uh, change my life for good. And and I, I told you this a couple of years ago, and then again this year is I think of you, Jill, every single day in my life. Every single day I think of you. I remember. As you step out of bed. Every when I step out of bed, every oh. single morning. So what do you and I both do when we step out of morning? When we step out of our bed in the morning, what's the first thank thing we you. do? You know, as I hit my right foot hits the ground, I go thank, and as my left foot, I say thank you. And so I learned um, from Dr. Jim, um, the major principle that I build my entire life on is the love concept. You know, make love your number one and make gratitude part of that. So, you know, Jim, I always used to say loving service, my first technique. Yes. And so I, the last words that I consciously input into my brain before I fall asleep is as I awaken tomorrow, I will greet this day with love in my heart, every person, every situation, every circumstance, because I choose to make my life sacred. And so I fall asleep with that thought. And when I awaken in the morning, before I step out of bed, I lay there for whatever it might take, 15 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute. And I recite that again. I said, as I awaken, right? I just changed the beginning. As I awaken again today, I choose to greet this day with love in my heart. And I, you know, my eyes are still closed. Like every person, and I focus on that. I want to get that feeling, every situation, no matter what kind of yogurt hits the fan today, every circumstance, but I'm still going to greet it with love, right? <laughs> Because I choose to make my life sacred. So a ritual, like, you know, what you tell yourself matters. There were all sorts of, you know, the Parker principles that I'm sure you've studied and you probably look at often still sit on the back of my desk in my home office. I've had the same principles in a frame for over 40 years. I love that. And, you know, Jim used to say, um, success is, you know, success is self-inflicted. Or you say 99% of success, you know, is self-inflicted. So if it is to be, it's up to me. Yes. Because he used to say 99% of failure is self-inflicted. So I flipped it to say, well, if 99% of failure is self-inflicted, and if it is to be, it's up to me, then so is 99% of success. Yes. It's self-inflicted. So what we tell ourselves actually matters. So back in the day, you know, when I was a, what behind the ears chiropractic student and they talked about affirmations. I didn't know why they would work, but my mentor said, you have to affirm who you want to become. Yes. And so I started doing it and people say, wow, that doesn't work. But let me tell you, it works. And we now know that it works from neuroscience that everything you tell yourself creates a symptom, a, a synaptic connection in your brain. And the more you repeat it, those synaptic connections grow and they build a pathway. So if you have a pathway of faith, confidence, and belief, FCB, the Dr. Jim would say, in your product, service, and idea, so FCB and PSI, if you have a path where you instill that consistently in your brain, you become what you think of most. Yes. And that is not a belief. It is a principle. Yes. Of how the nervous system actually works and how we yeah. impact ourselves and how we yes. impact other people around us. That, that, that. Um, you guys, this is one of the most wonderful things that, uh, as I get a privilege of being able to interview, um, you know, our professions, you know, top minds and healers, 
they, the most successful, the people who've done it long, who didn't get burned out are the people who have his heart and his mindset. What you just shared, the most successful. Now, Jill, I know, um, again, and you are very humble about this, but knowing and feeling I know you very well, you have tremendous success. You could have done multiple things, you know, within chiropractic, but you've chosen to give back. You've chosen to ensure that chiropractors are among the most affluent, influential, most wealthiest leaders on this earth. And I love that. I love from your humble beginnings as a chiropractor that you always share the the love of you have for people and for chiropractic and when push comes to shove i've seen a lot of docs and in my profession where you you, you kind of dwindle in your understanding of chiropractic when a crisis comes um would you be willing to share with us um i i, I know i, I mean I've, i can think of probably 30 or 40 stories that you've shared with me over the years but when push comes to shove and there's a personal crisis where does your understanding, where does your true understanding of chiropractic, where do those synapses really start firing when a crisis hits you? Would you mind sharing your, your experience with, with your son when he was a, a little boy? Yeah, th that was a beautiful experience because it brought me over the edge of understanding because I really thought I had a great understanding of the chiropractic principle. And I, you know, I would always go back to all organic systems are conscious, self-developing, self-maintaining, self-healing, provided there's no interference. That's my, that's my base. So that's the foundation on which I, I live because that's really what the chiropractic principles tell you in a nutshell. If we took the 33 principles and we sort of crushed them all together, that's the crux of it, right? Yes. All organic systems are conscious, self-developing, self-maintaining, provided there's no interference. And then it's broken down into all its, its parts through the 33 principles. So Christopher... Um, had a fireworks blow up in his face. So I was in bed, I, we were at the lake house and it was 10 o'clock at night. He was still outside with one of his buddies. I sort of told him, you know, be careful, this, that, and the other. And I was awakened by this boom, boom. And I woke up just long enough to realize, oh my gosh, they must have let, let go some firecrackers that we have for tomorrow's Canada Day party. You know, in Canada, we celebrate Canada Day July 1st, just like in the United States, we celebrate Independence Day on July 4th. And I went back to sleep. And as my neighbor would later tell me, about 20 seconds later, there was a third boom. But it wasn't the boom that woke me up. It was the sound of Christopher's voice screaming, help, I can't see. And so I, I innately jumped out of bed and I ran down more than 80 steps to the lakefront to see him just standing there in shock with flames still coming off his face. And I don't know how he did it. You know, he's talk about the physical ability when you do something. He was 14, but he probably weighed 150 pounds. He's a pretty big, solid kid, sort of like you, Jake. And I grabbed by the seat of his pants and I, and I literally dunked his head in the water to put the fire out. And I and I carried him up those stairs, like literally like that. I just walked up the stairs because I knew we were gonna, I mean, I could see his face. We were in a crisis. So we had coolers outside because we'd set up for the party the next day and, uh, you know, filled with ice and, you know, uh, soft drinks and beer and that kind of stuff for the big family party. So I dunked a towel in there and I wrapped his face in this cold water and I rushed him to the hospital. We got to the hospital and he asked for three things. Uh, that winter he had fractured his radius uh, and they had to set it. Uh, it was the first time that, that Christopher had ever had any type of medication. And basically I allowed them to give him an injection so they could set the fracture, which was the right thing to do. Right. I mean, right. there was a crisis there. So he asked for that. He said, dad, this really hurts. Can they give me what they gave me when they fixed my arm? I said, let, let me ask. Of course, I asked him. I said, look, they gave him a shot of Demerol, whatever you can do for the pain. We'd appreciate it. They did that. He asked for his brother and sister, his brother, who's Jason, who's a chiropractor in Chicago area. So he asked for his brother and sister, his moral support. And then he asked me to check him, which is what chiropractic kids do, right? He was raised as a chiropractic kid. So he was laying on the green in the hospital in the emergency department. This was before the physician ever showed up. It was before he got the injection, but he, he asked for those three things. And I checked him and his atlas was like, like out in right field. So I adjusted him. And every time he complained about it, I checked him again and I would adjust him. So the physician came in and um, examined him. That third blast, he had read the cartridge that said that there was two blasts. The reason for the delay between the second and the third blast, he reached down to dip it in the water to make sure there was no sparks because I taught my kids about safety, but there was a third blast. The third blast hit him in the face and went into his nose, came out of his mouth. So if you think of the fire, it completely burnt his face and it burnt him internally. Soft palate was completely burnt. No eyelashes, no eyebrows left. You know, and his, his nose was burnt like a crispy, 
if you could cook the hot dog on a campfire, um, we look at his, at his eyes with the physician. The physician, physician looks at his eyes and tells me to look at his eyes with him through an apparatus I'd never heard of before called the slit lamp. And it allows you to actually see a three-dimensional eye. And then once we looked at it, he said, you know, he was explaining to me, not speaking very loudly, explaining to me. And then we walked out of the room. He said, Joe, and I knew this physician. He said, um, he's going to be blind the rest of his life. His eyes are burnt 50% into his eyeball. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I said to him, yeah, you know, I understand, you know, what you're seeing. I understand what you're telling me. And I said, I don't want to be condescending, but you're a general practitioner, you're a PCP. Like we need to see an ophthalmologist. And we didn't have an ophthalmologist full time in our town. So I ended up convincing him to fly us to Toronto. And off we went to Toronto, saw two ophthalmologists there the next morning, told us the same thing. He's going to be blind for the rest of his life. Um, then we saw plastic surgeons and a team of three plastic surgeons. They looked at him and said, you know, he's young. He's got beautiful skin. They looked at his leg. They looked at his arms and everything else. So we're going to be able to do grass. It'll probably take two or three surgeries to fix his nose and fix these deep, deep burns that he's got on his cheek. Um, but um, the most important thing is for him to not get an infection. And so this head surgeon says to me, so we don't want him to travel. He's obviously, you know, too weak to travel. He need, really needs to rest to help his body heal. And um, I want to see him next Monday, like a week later. She said, can you just stay in Toronto? And I said, yeah, no problem. I'll check into a hotel. And, you know, I checked him, his upper cervicals, multiple times, obviously, in that first 12 to 16 hours, roughly. And when we got to the, to the hotel, my innate, I didn't, it was not a conscious thing. I automatically took the pillows from the headboard. I tucked the, the sheets in at the headboard and I untucked them at the footboard and I put my child who was heavily medicated, put him to bed and he slept a lot. But for all the parents who are listening in, it doesn't matter the age of your child, the size of your child. If they moan, if they're hurting, you're hurting, you're paying attention. And every time Christopher moaned, I would get up because, you know, we had to uh, two queen size beds in the room, I would get out of bed, I would check him. It was like my normal, I'd just go and I'd check him. And I will tell you that I was checking him to make sure that I kept his nervous system free and clear in the hope that he would not get an infection that would make the surgical procedures easier on my son. If if you ask me, why were you doing it? I want to keep him clear because I know that if he's clear, his body's gonna heal better. Never that I assume what was going to happen could even happen. On Wednesday, he wakes up and he says, dad, are you wearing a blue shirt? And I, I wear a lot of blue. I got blue today. And I said, yes. Why? He said, because before when I opened my eyes, it was like, there was like a black sheet in front of me, but now it looks like there's a color. I thought, oh, well, and I honestly thought nothing of it. That night, as God be my witness, I told the story many times, and if Chris was here, he'd repeat exactly the same. He says to me, um, he makes a comment about a TV show that I've got playing. It was Magnum PI. Remember the red Ferrari Magnum PI? I had had Magnum PI on the TV, and he wakes up from from a little nap. He's like, oh, you're watching Magnum PI. And he makes a comment about what is on the TV. And I was like, uh, what did you just say? I can't remember if it was, oh, I like his blue shirt or I like it, her red dress. I can't remember what it was, what the comment was. And I was like, what, what did you say? And he repeats it. And I says, you can see that? He said, yes. I said, what else can you see? Uh, and I always feel like I'm going to tear up right now. Okay, it's been a long time, right? He was 14. He just turned 37. Um, so he described everything he could see on the television screen. I am on, he's in bed, right? Watching like this on his tummy. I get on my knees and I'm holding him and I am bawling my eyes. I mean, I'm crying, like shaking. And he says to me, what's the matter, dad? I said, you can see? He says to me, did you think I was going to be blind forever? I said, yes, that's what three doctors told me. And he said, dad, 
the power that made the body heals the body. It happens no other way. So, you know, I mean, yeah, drop the mic, right? So from the mouth of babes, he was trained. He was taught that way. He was, he was raised that way. And that was his understanding. And that was his belief. There was no doubt in his mind that his body was going to fully heal. And he knew it wouldn't if he had interference. Wow. And, you know, like I said, today he'd walk in, he's about as big as you. Uh, not a mark on his face, by the way. We went back to the hospital. Like That's that's for another day. We went back to the hospital on the Monday. The 20-20 vision in both eyes. Never had surgeries. His body was fully healed with no mark on his face. After about six or seven weeks, eight weeks maybe total, you could not tell that he had that serious accident. Now, we're not going to say that chiropractic cures blindness or the chiropractic cures burns. All we can say is that the goal of chiropractic, as we said at the beginning, is to keep your nervous system clear so it can function at its optimum. And when there's no limitations of matter, which in the case, obviously, he wasn't because he was young, his body fully healed. And so we could say, as some of the doctors said, well, it's a miracle. You know, God has blessed you with your son healing. I said, yes, we could believe that. But my understanding is that the miracle is the human being. This is how God made us. Right? He made us to heal from above, down, inside out. That's how we were created. And so when there's no interference, that miracle has an ability to live and come through you. And that's what I believe occurred with Christopher. I, I get chills every time I... I get to, you know, hear that experience. And, and, and the most wonderful thing is that I know that we, we have the opportunity to see miracles like this every single day in our practices. And you can have all the money in the world. Um, I mean, and I'm sure you could have afforded the, the ability to take him anywhere you wanted by, you know, oh. to see the best surgeons, whatever. But that is the difference. That is a difference in the mindset and how a chiropractor really understands it, a chiropractic. You guys, when we truly understand what Jill has seen, that is where miracles take place. That is where that is where your practice will explode. When you are ever, if you ever feel burned out, if you ever feel exhausted, I dare say it is because you have become something that you do not want to become. You have chased money down a rabbit hole that you shouldn't probably have gone down. What I typically see is when when our when our colleagues are struggling, it's because they've chased something because they thought the chiropractic wasn't enough. Now I have no problems when you feel called if you have a talent um, to do something else outside of chiropractic. That's awesome. But to feel that chiropractic isn't enough, to feel and understand that that um, that it's that when when push comes to shove, when you are in a crisis that you can't see that type of result, I would encourage you fall in love with chiropractic, dive into chiropractic, focus on chiropractic. Let love be your guiding service. Your first, your first technique, as Jim uh, always taught, and watch these miracles come. And after that, the ripple effects of what happens in your practice and in your life comes. Money is a byproduct, right? Money is going to come, and it's going to come in avalanches. But your impact on the world is going to be what you are known for and what will truly fulfill you when you are passionate about what you get to do. When you're passionate about the honor of being a chiropractor, the miracles that come from that and the opportunities to do good is 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 inevitable. It is going to happen. Um, I, I absolutely love that about you, Jill, that the, that the levels of success you have, the impact that you make, that you always go back to the premise. You know, it's like what Michael Jordan taught, right? You know, when it comes to winning games, we don't talk about a tricky you know, three-point shot or a trick play. We talk about the fundamentals. And the fundamentals of chiropractic are being the best chiropractor you can, honing your skills, mastering your craft every single day, but it always is going to start from a place of sincere love. I love I'll that. I'll tell you another, another nugget that uh, Jim Parker dropped on me and many people over the years was, he says, I always remember that money is simply a byproduct of great service rendered. So when you focus on service, you don't have to focus about making money. You will make plenty. You'll make more than you can probably spend sometimes. And at Life University, those principles are also taught because a lot of people don't know that Dr. Sid Williams, who's the founder of Life University, his first mentor in chiropractic was Dr. Jim Parker. And so he took a lot of the lessons that he learned from Jim and then he crafted it using different words. So the loving service, my first technique uh, philosophy 
is alive and well at Life University, but it's they use different words. It's lasting purpose. Yes. To give, do, love, serve from your own abundance with no expectation of return. That's the caveat at the end, right? Lasting purpose, to give, do, love, serve from your own abundance, whatever that abundance is at the time, because it may not be financial, right? Maybe an abundance of love, an abundance of service consciousness, but with no expectation of return. You don't serve to get. You serve to give. And the more you serve, the more you receive. The, the hole you give through is the hole you receive through. And that has been the premise of my life since I understood the power of service. And I get up every morning, like I said, preparing myself to serve. Because I don't know what's going to happen today. I don't know who I'm going to meet. I mean, today we have a board of, a board of trustees meeting. I don't know what's going to happen in this meeting. But I showed up ready to serve. And here you and I are recording this minutes before this board meeting is about to start. No stress about that. It's a service consciousness. Yes. So I ask all of you, as you pay attention to what you can do in the world, pay attention on who you can be in the world. Because it starts by who you choose to be. And if you choose to be a loving servant, watch what you can do. Watch what you can accomplish. It will be exceptional. It always is. My dear friend and brother, Gilles, thank you so much for teaching us that the best person that we can be is an authentic servant, someone who truly serves. Um, please, you guys, serve those who are searching. Serve those who are are not where you are, who don't have the understanding and the mindset that you have. Serve. Find mentors like Jill. Support schools. Give back. The only way we can move our profession forward is by giving back. Donate to these schools. Donate of your time, your talents, your treasures. Donate. Find those who need and find those that can serve you and that can uplift you. Always start from a place of love. Jill, I, I truly love you. I'm grateful for you, grateful for all you do for me and for our profession. And uh, we are honored to have you at the helm. And we are grateful for what you're doing at life, grateful for what you're doing for our profession and uh, for all the, all the love you are putting into this world. Thank you. We sure love you. Thank you, Jake. It's a pleasure. And uh, closing words. Choose to be hope dealers. That's what we are. We are hope dealers. People want you. People want the service that you offer. Sometimes they just don't know that it's you they're looking for. So be the hope dealer. Keep spreading the love. Keep spreading the chiropractic message. And a closing word from another mentor who is Dr. Richard Yenny, who has since passed from Penn City, Missouri. If you know the truth about chiropractic, what gives you the right to know the truth and not share it? Wow. Share on. Share on. Thank you. And we will do just that. Thanks, Jake. It's a pleasure to be with you, buddy. Always, Jill. Love you. Have an awesome day. Love and appreciate you.